welcome to this episode of the Security Clearance Careers Podcast, ClearCast, your source for security clearance, intelligence community, espionage, national security, and defense contracting updates, and our exclusive interviews with intelligence community and government leaders. Welcome back. I'm attorney Sean Bigley, and I'm here with my co-host, Lindy Kaiser of clearancejobs.com. We're talking this segment about home ownership issues and security clearances. You know, Lindy, this has been, I think, something that's been on a lot of people's minds lately, not so much in the security clearance context, but if you own a home, just the value inflation and crazy things that have been happening in the housing market over the past few years. I know that it is certainly still a seller's market here where I am in California. And this is something I sort of joke about with my wife often. You know, she wants to stay. I, I, I say, hey, let's let's get out while the getting's good. Let's sell sell our house and make a nice profit. You know, but is this something that you see come up on the clearancejobs.com discussion boards? For sure. I think home ownership comes up in a few different ways. And like you said, you touched on a big one, which, you know, I think the kind of question now is, is the bubble going to burst? So I'm not seeing, you know, some of the issues. But if you look back historically, when we've had recessions before, a big issue was certainly for a lot of people who got underwater with their house. I think there is some speculation now, like, could we have some, you know, repercussions of that? And so then certainly people who a lot of cleared positions are in these super high cost of living areas. So there are some people asking, is it worth buying a home? Should I buy a home? And what should I be concerned about as a security clearance holder or applicant before I sign on the dotted line and end up with this enormous mortgage that I have to pay for? Yeah, well, it's, it's a great question. And I will tell you and our listeners that after the 2008, 2009 bubble burst, we were absolutely deluged with cases where people were having security clearances denied or revoked because they were underwater on their home. And I know that's a scary prospect for folks. I mean, you know, some of this is outside of your control, right? You know, we don't really have the ability as as individuals to put our hand on the lever and and determine, you know, which way the housing market is going to go. What is in each of our control is how leveraged or over leveraged we are in that investment. And so I think the biggest thing that I always tell people who are asking about this issue is you have to be careful that you are not over leveraging yourself in the house that you're buying or or thinking about buying. And, you know, that's, I think for a lot of people, common sense advice, irrespective of whether or not you hold a security clearance. But unfortunately, we're seeing, I think, kind of a repeat, albeit maybe a little less extreme of the circumstances that we had in the run up to the last housing bubble, where Credit is really easily available. Down payments are really low if you want them that way. Maybe some people are being given loans who ought not to be. And so I think that is feeding into some of this concern that you're, you know, mentioning about the possibility of another bubble burst. So, you know, there's there's not a magic number here and I'm not going to purport to tell anybody how much they can or can't put down on a home, but if you're buying a property and you have a security clearance, I would really be careful about asking questions like, can I make this payment if, for example, my spouse you know, loses their job or, or gets downsized? Can I make this payment if we have some unexpected expense? Can I make this payment if you know somebody gets sick in the family? Like those are things to take into consideration. Maybe you know you look at buying something that is a little bit below your means just so that you have that cushion in the event that life happens you're not going to be either out on the street or you know so far behind on the mortgage that the bank is trying to you know foreclose. It's an interesting point because that we are you know there's a lot of you know research or the data shows that younger people now are not part of the same home buying craze that a lot of people were and I think it is because of the market that we're in right now where hopefully folks are being kind of wise about it. And I don't want to discourage anybody from buying a home because I do think it could can be a good investment, but making sure that it's a wise one for your season of life and based on your, you know, the amount of savings you have, because if you don't have some form of cushion there, it is tough. It is. Yeah. And, you know, I, I will mention also, you know, when I say we were deluged with security clearance denials and revocations last time, there was a real lag in when we saw those cases. So, we didn't really start getting a lot of those cases until many years later. And I would say 2014, 2015, 2016 
was where we got a lot of cases involving people whose properties had been foreclosed on and they were dealing with a deficiency judgment, which is something that is you know, available to lenders in some states where, in other words, they reclaim the property, they sell it at a foreclosure auction, and then they come back to you and say, we disposed of your property, but it was for less than what you owed on the loan, so pay up the difference. And when you can't do that, then it goes to collections and sometimes they try to pursue it in court. It's not something that they can do in all states, thankfully, but there are a lot of states where lenders can pursue deficiency judgments. And the government was saying to our clients in those cases, look, we understand that life happens. We understand that the circumstances may have been outside of your control, but did you act reasonably? Did you try to resolve this or did you just walk away and throw up your hands? And it was a mixed bag. Some people could demonstrate that, yes, you know, they did everything possible. They, you know, engaged a realtor and, you know, tried to do a short sale of the property. They tried to, you know, return it to the bank in exchange for a waiver of the deficiency. Like there's all sorts of options that you have if you're in that situation and you need to talk to an attorney who handles real estate law to really understand what those may be depending on your state. But the folks who did that and and acted reasonably under the circumstances were largely fine. It was the folks who sort of ignored the bank or just walked away and, and threw up their hands that ran into problems. And unfortunately, we did see a lot of people in that latter category who wound up losing their clearances as a result. Well, you know, we've touched on buying a house here. We know that's really hard right now. But what if you're just a real baller and that DC paycheck is doing real well for you and you're thinking about buying a second home overseas? I've seen that one come up. I believe you've written about it for us before. And we've gotten that question from current clearance holders considering an investment property abroad, for instance, or even maybe they travel to Costa Rica or Spain or somewhere else, fell in love with it, really want to buy a property abroad. What have you seen on that lane? And what are some considerations before somebody considers investing in property overseas? Yeah, I, it's a it's a romantic notion, you know, that that uh, villa on the Italian coast or that, you know, retirement home in Spain. I, I get it completely. I understand what the draw is. And it is, you know, fairly common, actually. A lot of folks uh, become expats eventually, you know, in their retirement or they they do have that second vacation home. And for clearance holders, you do have to be cognizant of the perception. It's really not that the government necessarily cares that you know you have a vacation house in Western Europe or Costa Rica or whatever. It's can this be leveraged against you somehow by a foreign government or a hostile actor to sort of put the squeeze on you and get them to do your bidding? So Part of this is the identity of the country involved. I don't think anybody's going to really suggest that that would be the case with, you know, some of our more friendly uh, allied countries in, you know, Australia or something. I don't really think the government is going to be able to credibly make the case that there's a foreign influence risk there. We do have a lot of folks who are, for example, first generation immigrants and uh, for family reasons or nostalgia or whatever the case may be, they buy or they inherit a property in a country that's a little more dicey. China is very common. We've actually seen this come up in Russia as well. That's uh, more of a problem. And, you know, we always tell folks in those situations, you really, really want to be cautious about proactively doing something like that. If, you know, there's any possibility the country involved could be viewed as problematic. If you inherit something, you want to try to, you know, dispose of that as soon as possible, sell it, repatriate the funds to the United States. So there are situations where buying a property overseas or inheriting one is not the end of the world. But as a general rule of thumb, I don't advise it until you're in a position where that clearance isn't as imperative for you anymore. The flip side of that, and something I think is also really important to talk about is the benefit of buying a property in the United States. And is there a benefit specifically for clearance holders. And actually, there can be, particularly for clearance holders who are potentially dealing with a perception of foreign influence because of family members in another country or because of a property they own in another country. One of the ways we have been very successful in offsetting that concern is saying, yes, they own a vacation home in country X, but they also own a home here or they own two homes here or three homes here. And whatever the value is of the property that they own overseas or the you know, relationships that they have overseas, 
is outweighed or at least equal to whatever they have in the United States. And so if you are somebody who has family overseas or other connections overseas, that's actually something that can really help mitigate the concerns because they're going to look at you, they being the government and say, okay, they have something here, you know, tangible that's tying them to the United States. They're not just going to uproot and flee if we're closing in on them, then we, you know, we think they're, you know, spying or something. I'm glad you brought that up because I forgot about that. I have seen that come up in cases where they have, you know, listed somebody's attachment to the United States includes financial attachments significantly. So especially if you have possible foreign influence issues with relatives overseas, I think showing that you've actually invested more time, more money, more, more capital into building a life in the United States, that's going to help mitigate that. And I've seen that successfully done too. So that's a great point. Yeah. I think like everything, there are pros and cons to home ownership. And, you know, certainly there are lots of other things to consider beyond your security clearance when buying a home. So I would, you know, discourage anybody from getting tunnel vision and investing in a, a large purchase just because they're thinking that it's going to help them offset foreign influence concern or something along those lines. But there are very legitimate and very good reasons why buying a property can be helpful for your security clearance, among other things. For sure. On that, anything else on home ownership and your clearance? You know, just like anything, I would tell people, do your due diligence and be careful. It is an investment. It's oftentimes the biggest investment that most people make. And so if you would do research before investing in a stock or a bond, you got to do the same research before you buy that house. This is Katie Keller, editor at clearancejobs.com. Thank you for listening to this episode of Cleared Past. For more information on career and recruiting advice, visit news.clearancejobs.com.